The next item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on COVID-19 update. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Nicola Sturgeon. First Minister. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. As well as giving an update on the general COVID situation today, I will also share the latest information we have on the recently detected Omicron variant, and I will outline the steps we're taking to slow the spread of it and also to curb transmission of the virus more generally. Uh, first, though, today's statistics, 2,569 positive cases were reported yesterday, 11.5 per cent of all tests. 706 people are currently in hospital with COVID, nine fewer than yesterday, and 54 people are in intensive care, which is two more than yesterday. Uh, sadly, a further 10 deaths have been reported over the past 24 hours. That takes the total number of deaths under the daily definition to 9,572. And once again, I want to convey my condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one. Uh, more positively, the progress and the pace of the vaccination programme continues to be very good. 4,346,736 people have had a first dose. 3,949,736 have now had two doses. And in total, 88% of all those over the age of 18 are double dose vaccinated. In addition, 77% of 16 and 17 year olds and 59% of 12 to 15 year olds have had a first dose. And from today, 16 and 17 year olds can book their second dose of the vaccine online and I would encourage them to do so. On first, second, third and booster doses, we remain the most vaccinated part of the UK and that matters because as we know, vaccines do save lives. According to a study published last week by the World Health Organisation, there may be more than 27,000 people in Scotland who are alive today only because of vaccines. So I want to again record my thanks to everyone involved in organising and delivering the programme. In my statement last week, I expressed the view that our overall situation was much stronger than I had dared hope. Case numbers, although still too high, had stabilised and indeed they had started to decline. Since then, the data has become, if anything, even more encouraging. However, while case numbers here have continued to fall, the world has, of course, received the deeply worrying news of the new Omicron variant. I'll say more shortly about our current understanding of the new variant, but before that, I'll give just a bit more detail on the current overall trends in infection levels. In the past week, the average number of new cases being recorded each day has fallen from just under 3,000 to just over 2,500, which is a reduction of 15%. As in the past few weeks, the biggest decline has been in older age groups. Cases in the over 60 age group have fallen by 27%. And of course, that's very likely to reflect the ongoing success of the booster programme. Encouragingly, though, cases in the under 60 age cohorts, which account for the significant majority of cases in Scotland just now, have also fallen uh, in the past week by 13%. In fact, over the past week, cases have fallen in all age groups. Uh, the number of people in hospital has also fallen from 743 to 706, as has the number in intensive care from 60 to 54. So all of this is really positive news. It does indicate that vaccination, together with continued compliance with the protections that are still in place, is applying a firm downward pressure on transmission and therefore helping to reduce the overall health harms that the virus causes. All of that said, the NHS is still under significant and very severe pressure. Case numbers, though they are now falling, do remain very high and higher than we would want them to be going into the winter period. And of course, we know that a combination of factors pose a real risk that transmission will increase again through December and into the new year as colder weather forces us indoors more and festive socialising gets underway. This risk remains very real and if it materialises would put significant additional pressure on the NHS. And of course, the risk has now been significantly increased, at least potentially, by the emergence of Omicron. Let me turn, therefore, to what we currently know 
about the new variant. And perhaps the most important point to make at this stage is that most of the key questions about the impact and implications of it have not yet been answered. However, the number of mutations that it has and the nature of these, together with some of the very early indications from Southern Africa, have raised the concern that it might be more transmissible than the Delta variant, which of course is the currently dominant variant here in Scotland and many other parts of the world. Further data and analysis is needed to confirm this and also to assess what impact, if any, the new variant might have on the effectiveness of vaccines and on the risk of reinfection. It's worth stressing that there is no evidence at this stage to suggest that the disease caused by Omicron is more severe than that caused by other variants. Again, however, further analysis is required before we can be certain of this. Thanks to the work of the global scientific community, we will find out much more about Omicron in the days and weeks ahead. And as our knowledge and understanding expands, we will, of course, be able to assess with much more certainty the implications for our response to the pandemic. I very much hope that as we do learn more, our level of concern will diminish rather than increase. However, while hoping very much for the best, I think it is prudent at this stage to contemplate and prepare for something that is less positive than that. Uh, the fact is that any variant which might be more transmissible than Delta, which of course in turn was more transmissible than any variant that came before it, and which could, even if to a limited extent, evade vaccine or natural immunity, must be taken very seriously. That is why we have and will continue for now to respond in a way that is proportionate, but also highly precautionary. Uh, let me turn now to our current understanding of the presence of the Omicron variant here in Scotland. I can confirm that as of 5pm yesterday, uh, there are nine confirmed cases in Scotland. Uh, five of these are in Lanarkshire and four are in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. We have preliminary information on all nine of these cases, which is the basis of the information I am about to share with Parliament. However, I want to stress that health protection teams are continuing their investigations. Uh, let me say, firstly, that none of the people who have tested positive for this new variant have so far required hospital care. Uh, all nine were tested on or around the 23rd of November, and because they had tested positive, they have all been self-isolating. A surveillance look-back exercise had identified that the PCR test results in these cases showed what is called the S-gene dropout. This is not conclusive evidence of the Omicron variant, but it is indicative of it. However, whole genome sequencing of these positive samples has now confirmed that they are indeed the Omicron variant. None of these individuals, as far as we know, has any recent travel history to or known links with others who have travelled to the countries in southern Africa where the variant was originally detected. However, while the contact tracing exercise is still ongoing, health protection teams have established that all nine cases are linked. They all trace back to a single private event on the 20th of November. Indeed, we fully expect that there will be more cases identified over the coming days that are also linked to this event. In summary, the lack of any known travel or overseas connection to these cases does suggest that there is some community transmission of Omicron already happening in Scotland. However, the fact that all known cases are so far linked to this single event suggests that community transmission may still be limited. Indeed, there's so far nothing in the wider look-back exercise that Public Health Scotland has undertaken to suggest that community transmission of the new variant is either sustained or widespread. This look-back exercise has examined PCR test samples dating back to the 1st of November to identify any with this S-gene dropout. A number have been identified and uh, where the sample makes that possible, subjected to whole genome sequencing. And so far, this exercise has resulted in the nine cases that we have reported. Given the nature and scale of COP26, uh, the surveillance work that Public Health Scotland is doing is also looking at any potential links to it. 
At this stage, however, there is no evidence whatsoever of any such link. And while it is not impossible that one will emerge, I think the timelines involved make it, make it improbable. In short, Public Health Scotland is working hard to identify any and all cases of Omicron in Scotland as quickly as possible, and I am very grateful to them for these efforts. However, given the nature of transmission, I consider it highly likely, indeed almost certain, that more cases, perhaps many more cases, will emerge. However, the enhanced surveillance does give us the best possible chance of identifying cases quickly and through isolation of index cases and close contacts and targeted testing of then breaking transmission chains and containing spread while we learn more about this variant. And that is key because while so much about the new variant is so far unknown, it is important that we act on a highly precautionary basis. Uh, that is certainly true in terms of the steps that government must take, but it is equally true for all of us as citizens. We all have a part to play, and this has been true throughout the pandemic, in stemming transmission of the virus in general. And let's not forget that while we're talking about nine cases of a new variant right now, uh, two and a half thousand cases of Delta are still being recorded each day. So suppressing transmission of it remains important, but it is also now, of course, important to suppress and contain transmission of the new variant in particular. Some of the protections that the UK government announced at the weekend in relation to England, for example, the requirement to wear face coverings in some settings are already in place and in fact more extensive here in Scotland. So at this stage, rather than introducing new protections, we are asking people to significantly step up and increase compliance with existing protections such as face coverings, hygiene, home working, ventilation, vaccination and regular testing. This enhanced compliance domestically will complement the UK-wide travel restrictions confirmed over the weekend, which aim to reduce the risk of additional cases of the new variant entering the country. Ten countries from Southern Africa have been added to the travel red list so far. Anyone travelling back to Scotland from any of those ten countries must enter managed quarantine for ten days on their arrival. In addition, anyone arriving in Scotland from anywhere outside the common travel area is now required to take a PCR COVID test on or before the second day of their arrival, though we are advising that this should be on the second day and to self-isolate until they get the result of that test back. The Scottish Government's judgment is that it would be sensible given the incubation period of the virus and on a precautionary basis for these travel rules to be tightened further on a Four Nations basis. Uh, yesterday, the First Minister of Wales and I suggested to the Prime Minister that until we know more about Omicron, people arriving in the UK from overseas should be asked to self-isolate for eight days and take a PCR, PCR test on day eight after their arrival, as well as on day two. And uh, we look forward to discussing that uh, more in future. Uh, we also uh, suggested to the Prime Minister that the convening of a COBRA meeting to discuss this and other issues in early course would be appropriate. Presiding officer, while it, certainty is not possible at this stage and won't be possible until we know much more about this new variant, uh, my strong hope is that beyond temporary travel measures, no additional restrictions will be required. However, that will, of course, depend partly on what information emerges about Omicron in the days to come but also and significantly on all of us complying rigorously with all the protections currently in place to stem transmission. Of course, it remains the case that our first and most important line of defence against the virus is vaccination. We received updated advice yesterday from the JCVI. Its updated recommendations are as follows. All adults over the age of 18 should be eligible for a booster. Uh, the gap between second doses and boosters should now be reduced from six months to three months. Uh, people who are immunosuppressed and who have already had three doses should also now be eligible for a booster. Those who are immunosuppressed and have not yet had a third jag should get that now, regardless of when their second dose was administered. And finally, 12 to 15-year-olds should now be offered a second dose. 
The JCVI had, of course, already recommended second doses for 16 and 17-year-olds. And as I said earlier, from today, anyone in that age group can book an appointment for their second dose online. Uh, presiding officer, the Scottish Government has accepted the JCVI's updated recommendations and we will now put its advice into operation as soon as possible. Urgent modelling uh, work is being done to inform that operational response, for example, assessing the additional capacity that will be needed in terms of workforce and facilities. And as the JCVI has advised, we will continue to prioritise booster jags on an age and clinical risk basis. However, the bottom line is that many more people than was the case last week, at least one million more people are now eligible for a booster, and that is good news in our fight against this virus. Information will be provided as soon as possible for those who have become newly eligible. However, to those who are already eligible, if you haven't had your booster yet, please book to get it as soon as possible. Uptake in the over 60s is now 84%. That's high, but we want to get it higher still. So if, if you have yet to get the booster, please do so now. Similarly, if you're aged between 40 and 59, please book online at NHS Inform. Now, I know there is a concern that the vaccines will be less effective against this new variant. And I want to stress we don't yet know if that is the case. But even if it is, vaccination will still matter. Less effective does not mean ineffective. Uh, and of course, uh, the vaccines will remain uh, just as effective uh, as they are now against the Delta variant, which is still the dominant one circulating in Scotland. So a booster will significantly improve our protection against all variants. It really is the most important thing any of us can do to protect ourselves and loved ones. Uh, similarly, if you still haven't had your first or your second dose, uh, please arrange to do that too. It is now more important than ever to get an appointment and to get the protection vaccination will offer you. In addition to getting vaccinated, and as I said earlier, all of us should now step up and significantly increase our compliance with existing protections like face coverings, ventilation and hand hygiene. Uh, we are also strongly encouraging everyone who can work from home to do so. And we are asking everyone from now through the festive season to do LFD tests on any and all occasions before mixing with people from other households, whether that is in a pub, a restaurant, a house or a shopping centre. And of course, from Monday, subject to Parliament's approval uh, this week, proof of a recent negative lateral flow test or vaccination will be accepted by venues and events covered by the COVID certification scheme. It is already very easy and it is free to get lateral flow tests. They can be ordered online or collected from pharmacies and test centres. If you're a secondary school pupil or a member of staff at a school or early learning centre, test kits are also available free of charge from schools and early year centres. However, I can confirm today that in the run-up to the festive period, lateral flow tests will also be made available by local authorities in many more locations. Uh, these locations will obviously vary in different parts of the country, but they will include shopping centres and supermarkets, garden centres, sports grounds and Christmas markets. Uh, we're also working with transport partners to provide access to tests in transport hubs. So while it's already easy to get lateral flow tests, we're taking steps to make it easier still. So please make sure you get a supply, keep it topped up and use that supply. It's also worth mentioning that the newer devices are much easier to use than the older ones. They require nasal swabs only rather than nasal and throat swabs. So if you've previously tried lateral flow tests and given up because you found them too difficult or uncomfortable to use, please do try again now. Remember also to report the result of tests online. And if a test shows up positive, isolate at home until you have had and got the result of a confirmatory PCR test. Uh, if we all do this over the next few weeks, it will make a really big difference because we will all massively reduce the risk of infecting others, particularly if we have the virus but wouldn't otherwise know about it because we don't have symptoms. So please test yourself before mixing with others uh, and on every occasion that you intend mixing with others. Presiding officer, to uh, draw my remarks to a close, uh, there's no doubt that the emergence of this new variant is a blow, um, certainly a potential blow. Uh, it is the most concerning, potentially the most concerning development in the pandemic in recent months. But even if our developing knowledge about the variant confirms some of our worries, and let's hope it doesn't, we are still in a much better position 
than we were this time last year, thanks to vaccines. And we know what we need to do to stem transmission because we've done it before and we know it works. So it's down to all of us to make sure that we do it. So if in recent weeks we've been sticking a bit less strictly to public health advice, now is the time to follow it rigorously again. Get vaccinated, single most important thing we can do. Uh, secondly, test regularly on any occasion before socialising or mixing with other households. And finally, comply with all existing protections. Please wear face coverings on public transport in shops, when moving about in hospitality settings, keep windows open to improve ventilation, follow all advice on hygiene, wash hands and surfaces and work from home if you can. Uh, the discovery of this new variant really does make these measures even more important than ever before. If we treat the news of the new variant as an opportunity to raise our guard again, I hope we can protect the progress made in recent weeks. And we can give ourselves the best possible chance of enjoying not just a more normal Christmas, which we all want, but a safer Christmas too, and also of avoiding any tighter restrictions in the weeks ahead. So please get vaccinated, get tested and comply with all of the protections in place. If we all do this, we'll play our part in slowing the spread of the virus generally and this new variant in particular. Thank you. The First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 40 minutes for this item, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. And it would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak button now. And I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Last week, the First Minister came to this chamber and was upbeat in her assessment of the COVID outlook, saying that the situation was more positive than we might have expected it to be. At the same time, last week my party was calling for the easing of some restrictions. But as we have seen time and time again with this virus, a lot can change in just a week. The situation has shifted and so must our approach adapt as well. The UK Government and the Scottish Government's response to the emergence of this new variant has been swift in recent days. Nobody wants to see restrictions return. We are all completely fed up with this virus and the limits that it's placed on our lives for nearly two years now. But we have to be realistic and sensible, evaluate the situation fully as we learn more about this new variant. But while we wait for more information, we are not defenceless against this virus. The vaccination scheme has always been our best weapon against COVID-19. As the First Minister's statement noted today, experts estimate that more than 27,000 lives in Scotland have been saved as a result of our vaccine. The booster programme across the UK is going well, but there's no doubt that there could be even more urgency in delivering it. For weeks now, we've been calling for the reopening of mass vaccination centres to speed up that rollout. These centres were incredibly effective in the rollout of the initial doses of the COVID vaccine, yet this morning her health secretary dismissed our proposal. Hamza Youssef suggested the hold-up in reopening these centres was due to a shortage of staff. So can the First Minister confirm if that is the case and what is being done to resolve these issues? And finally, after the JCVI's decision, there are now almost two million people in Scotland waiting to get their vaccine. Considering just how crucial it is for as many people as possible to get that booster jag, can the First Minister tell us what additional measures she is taking now to accelerate this vital booster programme? First Minister. Well, can I say, first of all, I remain um, more positive uh, than I was a few weeks ago about the situation, and that's notwithstanding the emergence of the new variant. As I've uh, set out today, uh, the overall trend of infections in Scotland is downwards. Uh, a few weeks ago, I would uh, not have dared hope that that would be the case. We know there are risks in the weeks ahead. Uh, I said that last week in terms of socialising around the festive period, uh, colder weather, pushing us all indoors more. Uh, there is an additional risk now, potentially, uh, in the form of this new variant. Uh, but we are in a stronger position to confront all of that than would have been the case at this time last year uh, or even a few weeks ago. Uh, vaccination is uh, the best line of defence, which is why uh, there is no lack of urgency on the part of the Scottish Government, nor do we rule out any options. Uh, we uh, discuss on an ongoing basis the appropriate ways in which we can accelerate 
uh, the progress of the vaccination programme. Uh, we have uh, had questions, and I would always expect questions on this, about the, the route, the deployment route we chose uh, for 12 to 15 year olds, for example, and again, uh, the deployment routes we have chosen uh, for this uh, stage or the first stages of the booster campaign. Actually, the routes we have chosen have taken us to where we are today, which is the most vaccinated part of the UK. On, on booster vaccines so far, uh, we are quite a way ahead of any other nation in the UK. Of course, we want to go further. That was true before the JCVI updated its, its advice yesterday uh, on those who were eligible then. It's even more true now when we have so many more people eligible. So we are currently considering all possible options to do that, and we're not alone there. I know the UK government, the Welsh government, the Northern Irish government are having to do the same. Uh, on staff, there's not a shortage of staff. Uh, we have uh, got staff in place to uh, do the rollout that we had planned on the basis of the old advice, but given that there are, as of today, more than a million people eligible that weren't eligible this time yesterday, we clearly have to find more staff uh, and more facilities uh, to speed that up. That's the work that is underway right now, and we will focus ourselves, uh, get our shoulders to the wheel, uh, work with health boards whose shoulders are also to the wheel to get that to happen as quickly as possible. And all four of the nations across the UK are going to be doing that. Uh, the good news is that we have adequate supplies of vaccines, although I think uh, developments in the last few days remind all of us uh, that we need to get vaccines uh, distributed more equitably across the whole world, because until the whole world is vaccinated here, I think we're being reminded right now, none of us are out of danger. So we will continue. The vaccination programme is the most important thing the government is doing right now, and we will continue to push it forward as fast as we possibly can. Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. I want to start by sending my condolences to those that have lost uh, a loved one. Yesterday, we had confirmation that patients in Scotland had tested positive for the Omicron variant. Uh, perhaps most troubling was the news that none of the cases identified had a travel history, meaning they caught the variant in the community. That is obviously causing uh, anxiety and concern. The tools to protect us from the virus remain the same – vaccine, testing and contact tracing. Uh, the JCVI have now recommended that the booster jag should be made available to all aged over 18, and the gap between the doses uh, reduced to three months. Before this change, there were over 800,000 people eligible for a booster. This change means there are now over 2 million people eligible for their booster dose. The government previously set a target of 400,000 COVID vaccinations a week. Does that remain the target? The last week was just under 240,000. I note what the First Minister says about supply chains and storage. Given we are expected to ramp up the number of vaccinations, are we confident of those supply chains in the coming weeks and months? And currently, just two health boards, Tayside and the Western Isles, are running drop-ins for boosters. Will this be extended to all health boards to demonstrate the urgency, especially given the much more higher numbers of people that we now expected to get their booster vaccination? We can't rely simply on a phone line or a booking system to meet that demand. Finally, this will also add additional pressure on test and protect. What additional resources will be made available to ensure that cases, particularly of this new variant, can be properly tracked and so transmission can be reduced? First Minister. Well, firstly, um, I said yesterday, actually, when I uh, addressed these issues, that the fact that, as far as we know, uh, none of the cases identified so far have a travel uh, history or a connection to anybody who has recently travelled to the African countries where this variant was first identified was a cause of concern, because that is indicative of community transmission. Um, that is still the case, but I think today the work that health protection teams uh, through Test and Protect have done um, identifying that all of these cases are linked and linked to one event actually slightly reduces that anxiety because it gives us more assurance that that community trans transmission is not widespread and we're not picking up any more widespread evidence of it in the quite extensive look back that Public Health Scotland has been doing. Just to be clear, they have been looking at all PCR samples uh, that have been done from the 1st of November to identify any that have this S gene dropout, which used to be indicative of the 
alpha variant, uh, which has more or less disappeared, is not indicative of the Delta variant generally. So if it is appearing recently, uh, then the suspicion is that it is Omicron. Uh, so that exercise so far has only identified these nine cases. Now, I would expect that we will have more cases associated with this event and more generally. But I think uh, the work that has been done to get us to the position where I can stand up and say all of that is a huge credit to Public Health Scotland and to health protection teams and to test and protect. Um, and I want to thank them for that. Um, on vaccinations, I, I will repeat everything I said to Douglas Ross. Uh, we will accelerate the programme as far and as fast as we can. The 400,000 a week target, and it's, this is a really important point to uh, clarify, was for COVID and flu vaccinations. It, Anna said, no, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Um, and that is being exceeded. Uh, we will have to increase uh, the number of vaccinations that are being done on a weekly basis. But again, it's important. The JCVI and everybody recognises that not everybody can be vaccinated on a single day or immediately. So the order of priority in which we do it is important. And that also has a bearing on how we choose to do it. Drop-in centres are important when we get to certain stages of a vaccination programme, but we've got to be uh, careful that we don't use them inappropriately. If we only do it through drop-in, then Anna Sarwar, who is considerably younger than I am, can get ahead of me for vaccination when my risk is higher because I am older. Now, I'm using as an example. Obviously, there are more extreme examples because he's not that much younger than me, <laughs> uh, but the general point... I am making is understood. So I'm trying to say we are doing all of these things in a way that gets us through as quickly as possible, but also follows proper, sensible clinical risk uh, considerations as well. Um, and the last point, and we'll keep Parliament updated on the, the rollout of the vaccination programme, how we are increasing uh, capacity and how we are planning to speed up uh, that uh, roll out as far as possible. Uh, I'm not complacent about this um, and we'll be held very strongly to account in weeks to come over this as is right and proper but our progress so far suggests that the way we have been de deploying uh, these vaccinations is the best way to, to do that so we'll continue to learn uh, from past experience and, and finally uh, we will continue through the efforts that have got us to the point of identifying these nine cases today to try to identify cases as quickly as possible. The advantage of the S gene dropout with this variant compared to Delta is that it does allow indications of the presence of the variant to be identified through PCR testing, but then genomic sequencing is required to confirm it. So all of that work will be ongoing while we learn more about the variant in the days to come. Alex Colehampton. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. The emergence of new variants will always be a source of real concern as we try to navigate our way out of this crisis. We have learned to expect the unexpected, however, as uh, for as long as the Global South remains largely unvaccinated, this will keep happening. Right now, Presiding Officer, richer countries like our own, like Great Britain, are stockpiling uh, vaccines far in excess of what we will ever need, and many will go to waste when they could have gone to developing countries. So can I reflect the the First Minister's marks in my own and say that that needs to change. Presiding officer, we need to stop Omicron in its track, or at the very least buy us enough time so that we can learn more about the effects of Omicron and get more boosters into arms. We know that the contact tracing system is already under immense strain. So can I ask the First Minister if she will consider instructing a programme of door-to-door -door surge PCR testing in communities around affected areas? First Minister. Uh, no, I won't, because I don't think at this stage uh, to, do, uh, to instruct that on a blanket basis would be right or appropriate or the best use of resources that are under uh, pressure, although coping very well. And today of all days, I am not very sympathetic to any criticisms of our contact tracing teams who are uh, you know, doing heroic work right now uh, to identify and understand uh, the transmission patterns of these cases. But it is the case that we can use and are using targeted uh, enhanced testing where cases are identified. So that will start with these cases of testing of close contacts, uh, because we want close contacts to uh, isolate as well. And where health protection teams, and this is important, I think they are best placed to understand and to judge where enhanced testing should be used. There may be some instances, as was the case uh, earlier this year in the south side of Glasgow, where door-to-door -door testing is appropriate. There might be. 
but that has to be driven uh, by the assessment of health protection teams. I think with these nine cases, with the loopback surveillance that is being done, that wouldn't necessarily uh, be the right use of resources at this point. But if health protection teams think otherwise, they, of course, have the ability and the resources to get on and do that. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. And just picking up very briefly on a, a point raised, but which I think would be important for people certainly in Fife to be aware of, NHS Fife is offering booster drop-in clinics from 5pm this evening, so I think that's important to put on the record. But taking into account the latest emphasis on working from home where possible and the continuing importance of wearing face coverings, can the First Minister provide reassurance to my Cowden Beath constituents that these key protection measures will be the subject of extens extensive public health information, uh, uh, awareness raising campaigns, and will in fact be enforced. First Minister. Uh, firstly, Annabel Ewing's first point is important. There is no uh, absolute one size fits all approach to how health boards are delivering vaccinations. Some are at different stages using drop in clinics, um, and that is appropriate. So, this is about getting to people as quickly as possible through a variety of routes, and that will continue to be the approach. In terms of public awareness, yes, uh, we already have TV. Uh, radio, digital and outdoor campaigns uh, reminding the public of the key protections in place and the need to comply with those. Uh, we will intensify those over the winter period uh, to ensure that everybody knows what has been asked of them. We will be putting particular stress on the request to people to test themselves before going to the pub or the rest or a restaurant or to visit somebody's house over Christmas or to go Christmas shopping. That is really important. That can do uh, a lot to help us break train, chains of transmission. Uh, local authorities and the police uh, also continue to take action to raise awareness um, in particular settings. So there will be a big focus on making sure uh, that people understand what we're asking them to do, um, and uh, that's important. But I think after two years, we all know what works against this virus. We're all just tired, uh, and I include myself in that, of doing it. But that's why this is an important moment for all of us to up our compliance again uh, so that we can stop not just this new variant of the virus, but the virus generally in its uh, tracks and mitigate against the risks over winter. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, only 33% of 50 to 59-year-olds have received their booster jabs. However, last week they accounted for 20% of hospital admissions, the highest of any age category. In light of this, can the First Minister spell out how many more vaccinators need to be deployed and how quickly these resources will be on the ground in order to speed up the delivery of the booster jab? And will she finally commit to mass vaccination centres? First Minister. I'm not going to repeat my answer on mass vaccination centres. I think I've set out the, the rationale and the thinking there. Um, and, you know, underline the point that we are currently the most vaccinated part of the UK, including, and actually in particular, on booster Jags. On the issue, and it's an important issue about getting uptake up in all age groups, but take 50 to 50 nine-year-olds, some of 50 to 59 and 50 to 59 year olds aren't vaccinated yet and I, I'm in this category until yesterday when the gap between second dose and booster dose was reduced I wasn't yet eligible for uh, my booster vaccination I didn't become eligible until later in December because of yesterday's change I've now uh, been able to go online and book an earlier appointment so there are lots of appointments becoming available every day uh, that will continue to be the case and to everybody uh, in a similar position to me uh, try now to bring forward uh, your booster appointment we can't vaccinate everybody on a single day that is never going to be or even in a single week this will take uh, a number of weeks for us to work through we will do that in the order of priority that the jcvi recommends but we're going to get through this just as quickly as possible because it is our best line of defense in the period ahead Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, I thank the First Minister and the Health Secretary for acting so swiftly to resolve the boosters issue in Cumbria that I raised last Tuesday. My constituents greatly appreciate it. First Minister, figures show that vaccination levels in Scotland are lower in the often highly mobile 30 to 39 age group than in any other. What steps have been taken to encourage people in that cohort specifically to get vaccinated? First Minister. Well, a lot of different um, actions have been taken by health boards through communication, through the location of uh, vaccination centres to target the groups that uh, where uptake is lower, where we know for a variety of reasons people are less likely to 
come forward. So, you know, that has included places of worship, other community settings, uh, providing concessionary bus travel to appointments, for example, working with uh, community leaders in different uh, parts of society to try to do that. So I think all of us have a part to play here to just do everything we can to get these messages across. It is worth noting that even in that 30 to 39 year old age group, uptake is high. You know, uptake across the age groups are higher than for not all of these age groups, of course, are eligible for flu, but we are seeing a much higher uptake than we have seen for flu in recent years. Uh, this is about trying to get to those groups where we still need it to be higher and a whole range of different ways are being used and will continue to be used to try to do that. Rona Mackay to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's welcome news that the First Ministers of both Scotland and Wales are in close contact over precautions in the face of the new variant. Can the, the First Minister provide an update on any response that she and Mark Drayford have, had, uh, have received from the Prime Minister regarding greater controls for travellers arriving in the UK? First Minister. As, as far as I'm aware, no formal response has uh, been received from that letter yet, although I know the UK government did indicate its uh, initial uh, views on it uh, yesterday, as it was uh, perfectly entitled uh, to do. Uh, we'll continue to argue for things that we think are sensible. I think it would be uh, good for all four nations uh, through the medium of COBRA to uh, get together to discuss uh, different approaches to this in the coming days, and I hope that will be possible. That said, we are, you know, communicating closely across all four nations. Uh, I took part in a four nations call uh, with Michael Gove and the other first ministers on Saturday evening. Uh, I know the health secretary has had a number of discussions with counterparts in the other nations. So there is good and close communication. Uh, but of course, some of these decisions uh, are driven by the views of the UK government. So on occasion, it is really important for us to press them if we think different things have to be done. And in that regard, I speak to uh, the First Minister of Wales uh, reasonably often, um, and we exchange views on these things as we will continue to do. I will now call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank you very much. Presiding officer, can I just follow up that response from the First Minister? Because, of course, the suggestion from the First Minister and from the First Minister of Wales is that the travel restrictions should apply to everybody, ir irrespective of country of origin, self-isolating for eight days. If the UK government do respond negatively, will the First Minister impose these restrictions herself, as she has the power to do so? She will, of course, recognise that this has already had a chilling effect on travel businesses, with many families' plans for Christmas in the balance. So what advice can she offer people? Should they book to go away or not? And what compensation could she put in place for the travel industry if further restrictions are applied? First Minister. Uh, what's had a chilling effect on people, if that is the case, although it's not a terminology I would use, is the emergence of a new variant, frankly. Uh, not anything that we are trying to do sensibly uh, to limit the spread of the new variant so that further restrictions on people's uh, freedoms and, and way of life are not necessary in the weeks to come. Thankfully, the uh, Labour First Minister of Wales seems to take a, a more constructive and a more sensible approach to uh, these issues than some of his colleagues uh, in this chamber uh, do. I've, I've said uh, before, and We've, we've had this discussion many times before in terms of travel restrictions. We, uh, and, you know, I'm not averse to doing things unilaterally where that makes sense, but obviously, as anybody who understands travel patterns knows, is that many people travel to Scotland via and to Wales via airports in England. So just having a, a, a situation like this, a, a rule like this in place here, it would not be effective. It would not get us the public health benefit, but it would do disproportionate damage to our airports, which is why I think these uh, kind of protections are better and only really effective on a four nations basis. Uh, the First Minister of Wales and I are in agreement. We hope this would be a temporary measure, but right now we, we need to do two things. We need to try to limit any transmission of the, uh, the presence of this variant that is already in Scotland, but while we are doing that, we need to try and ensure that we're not exacerbating that difficulty by importing more of it uh, here. So that's why these things are important and we will continue uh, to have constructive, I hope, constructive discussions about these things in the days and weeks ahead. Julie Mackay to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Greens have promoted a cautious approach throughout this pandemic and with the emergence of the new Omicron variant, we believe that caution must be maintained. The need for robust test, trace and isolate systems have never been more important. 
The reintroduction of the day two PCR test is welcome. I made the case previously that we should have retained it. We know that PCR tests allow us to monitor new variants entering the country in a way that lateral flow tests simply cannot. Will the First Minister commit to keeping these important tests in place for the duration of the pandemic so that we can detect any new variants on entry and not wait until community transmission is already taking place? First Minister. I think we've got to continue to judge the proportionality of all of the measures, protections, restrictions that we have in place. There's no doubt that having some protections in place now uh, will avoid the need for restrictions later, uh, but it's not legally as well as in many other ways, it's not possible simply to give a blanket commitment to keep anything in place indefinitely. We have a legal requirement to test the proportionality of measures on an ongoing basis. That's why we have three weekly reviews. But I, I take the point that Gillian Mackay is making about the importance of uh, measures to help us detect whether new variants are coming into the country. This new variant appears to have been uh, detected very quickly. Um, it's been detected in Southern Africa and all credit to governments there for doing that so assiduously and so quickly. That doesn't mean it originated in any of these African countries. Um, we don't know that uh, yet, but it does underline the importance of having uh, good surveillance and detection measures in place. Testing will always be a part of that, but we have to ensure that uh, any measures we have in place remain proportionate and are not kept in place for longer than is necessary. Christine Graham to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, this is further to Annabel Ewing's uh, question. Now, while I accept it's a minority, anecdotally there does appear to be an increase in the numbers not sanitising the shopping trolleys, not wearing masks on public transport or indeed in stores, <laughs> and in, in stores not having someone monitoring at entry points. Can I therefore ask what discussions the government has had with transport operators and store managers about increasing awareness of their customers to these mandatory requirements? And do, does the government have any data on non-compliance? First Minister. Uh, we have a range of data about compliance with different measures. I think we published, uh, if memory serves me correctly, some of that on a regular basis. But if we don't, I'll see what we can uh, provide um, on that. Um, we discuss regularly with transport operators, with the retail sector, with business organisations. Generally, the Finance Secretary had a, a roundtable discussion with business organisations just yesterday um, about all of the different ways they can help, including facilitating working from home wherever possible. I think it is the case, though, and I, you know, again, I include myself in this, where uh, we have all, because we're sick and tired of this, because we have been in a period where perhaps the perceived risk uh, has been reducing, we all perhaps feel a bit stronger, as we should, because of vaccination, that we've all been letting our guard slip a bit around these basic mitigations. I think that is understandable. But now is a moment, uh, not just because of the new variant, although that is definitely uh, increasing uh, the need for this, but because of the risk that winter poses anyway. Over this period, which might be really, really challenging, if we do all of these basic things, all of that added together will make a difference. So if we have, as I'm sure all of us have, been forgetting to do some of these things in recent weeks, this is the time just to stop, to think about what we need to do and make sure we do it, because it really will help us through this winter uh, much more safely than will otherwise be the case. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In August, we were told that a Scottish inquiry into the handling of a pandemic will begin before the end of the calendar year. Can the First Minister tell us if this commitment will be delivered, and if not, when will it be delivered? First Minister. Uh, yes, our commitment will be uh, delivered, which was to ensure the establishment of the public inquiry before the end of this calendar year. We are uh, in the process of uh, identifying and appointing a chair uh, for the inquiry, and uh, I know we intend to update Parliament on that before the Christmas recess. Of course, once the uh, inquiry is established, once a chair has been appointed, uh, the time scale and the process for starting to take evidence and all of the other aspects of the inquiry are very much down to the independent uh, chair who takes that forward. Bill Kidd to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Yes, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, thank you, First Minister, for the update. Given the new variant, people are getting their booster jab. Um, has become much more important and many people have actually received their initial and second vaccines outside of Scotland. They are Scottish residents but they've got their jabs outside of Scotland. How can we ensure that they receive their booster jab here? First Minister. 
Uh, well, they should uh, be able to, boost, uh, to receive their booster jack here. Obviously, uh, there may be some individuals in a particular uh, category uh, that, uh, if any. But he has constituents uh, in that position, by all means, uh, let us know when we look into the individual uh, circumstances. But generally, anyone who has, is eligible for a booster here in Scotland who hasn't received an appointment or can't book uh, through the website can call the helpline. Uh, I'll give that number 0800 030 8013. And that includes anyone who has received one or both doses outside of Scotland. Uh, so if you haven't had your appointment, call the helpline uh, and they will assist you in getting one. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. The enhanced surveillance that the First Minister talked about earlier and the vaccine rollout is extremely impressive in Scotland. And I think it does give people hope that we can fight this. Given the massive pressures on the booster programme and the wider eligibility, including after second dose, reducing that from three months to six, does the First Minister think that Greater Glasgow should be resourced to establish again the Louisa Jordan as a vaccine centre, as it was a quite a critical venue in, in achieving the success that we have now? First Minister. Uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, like all health boards, will judge what facilities they need. And if any health boards want to discuss with us uh, you know, the, the establishment of one on that scale, of course, we will discuss that with them and discuss the resource implications of that. The, Louisa Jordan did a fantastic job. Um, there's no doubt about that. And what I'm about to say is not intended as any criticism of, of those uh, who did so much work there. It's, it's in the nature sometimes of these very large centres that also, I think, have the highest do not attend rate in the country. So this, and you know, members have heard me say this so many times, there is a constant balance that needs to be struck here between big you know, throughput, speed of access, and also local accessible uh, availability as well, because many members also raise uh, the inconvenience of people having to go to somewhere like the Louisa Jordan. So this is a balance. Uh, I think health boards are striking that balance really well, but with the kind of extension that we have had as of yesterday, we have to rethink uh, whether any of these different approaches are appropriate or not. And that is just a process. It's a process that is underway right now and will continue right throughout this programme uh, and no doubt into the next one, which I fear will be coming uh, before we know where we are as well. Stephanie Callaghan to be followed by Tess White. Thank you. With not only winter, but the, the new Omicron variant upon us, it's really imperative that everybody over age 70 uh, is vaccinated with a third dose at pace. While third dose vaccination coverage amongst this age group is positive and really encouraging, around 10 per cent of all over 70s in Lanarkshire are still to receive the third dose. Can the First Minister confirm when the programme for over 70s is expected to be effectively completed? First Minister. Well, the, the programme for over 70s will be completed as soon as everybody who is going to come forward for uh, a vaccination has come forward. People in the over 70 age group have been receiving invitations, I think, from early October. Uh, the vast, vast majority are already vaccinated. So anybody in that age group who is not vaccinated is because they have chosen or have been unable to come forward uh, and be vaccinated. So again, we continue to put out the messages. If you are one of these people, it's not too late to get vaccinated. Go online, book an appointment, phone the helpline, the number of which I've just given, and get an appointment. Everybody in that age group who, who has wanted a, a vaccination has already been offered a vaccination. And of course, we're now working uh, rapidly through the other age groups and will continue to do so. Tess White to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you've said vaccination is the best line of defence. Yesterday, NHS Grampian closed vaccination centres in Aberdeenshire as a result of Storm Arwen, while damage and debris are still affecting the road infrastructure in the North East. Has the Scottish Government made any assessment of the number of people unable to attend vaccination appointments because of the storm? And will action be taken to ensure vaccination centres stay open safely during severe weather this winter. First Minister. Uh, efforts were made to ensure that vaccination centres, where possible, could stay open safely. But you know, everybody, and particularly those from uh, the 
parts of the country uh, most heavily affected know that it was not possible uh, safely to keep every vaccination centre open and it would have been irresponsible, deeply irresponsible, to have sought to do so. Anybody whose vaccination uh, appointment had to be cancelled will be rescheduled and yes, everybody will get access uh, to vaccination and I know that uh, work will uh, already be underway. Uh, the Deputy First Minister is about to make a statement more generally on uh, the, the very severe impact which many people uh, in the north uh, and indeed uh, some people in the south of the country are still experiencing in terms of still not having uh, access to power. Uh, the Deputy First Minister will give an update on that shortly and there is a, a significant amount of work uh, underway to make sure that people are reconnected as quickly as possible, that welfare support is provided in the interim and also that any wider impacts and vaccination certainly is one of those uh, will be uh, rectified and caught up with as soon as possible. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Katie Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the First Minister indicate when those exempt from the vaccine passports due to a terminal illness will receive their vaccine exemption letters as a constituent of mine who has been confirmed as exempt by NHS Goods to Glasgow and Clyde on the 10th of November still hasn't received their letter? Clearly, time is of the essence for patients such as my constituent. First Minister. Well, Stuart McMillan wants to write to the Health Secretary um, about his individual constituent. I'm sure that can be looked into. However, it's important to stress that in the vast majority of cases, um, a successful route to safe vaccination can be found. Uh, that usually includes people who have terminal illness. Most of, uh, the, of those in that category will still benefit from vaccination. However, where vaccination is not uh, straightforward, support is available and uh, the local helpline, uh, the COVID status helpline or local vaccination centres can help answer questions about the vaccine and what arrangements are in place around exemption. Uh, that's the general position. However, if there are individual cases where somebody uh, has not, uh, for one reason or another, been able to navigate that system, please let us know so that we can look into that as quickly as possible. Katie Clark to be followed by Emma Harper. Like others, I have been contacted by a number of constituents over the last few weeks who are eligible for the booster but have had difficulty accessing it despite the helpline. Can the First Minister provide a detailed breakdown by age group of those who have been offered and received the booster and if she feels at the moment that mass um, vaccination centres and drop-ins aren't the best way forward, could she outline what she thinks can be done to put resources in to make it easier um, for people to get the booster? First Minister. Uh, information on the numbers in different age groups uh, that have been vaccinated with the booster is published regularly. That uh, information is available. Uh, there is, as I think has been reflected through some of the questions and answers today, there is a, a mixed uh, provision of access to booster vaccination. Um, and that is right because not every part of the country is the same. There has to be a, a reflection of the geographical position. Um, and we continue to address any localised issues where access has been difficult and resolve that. That will continue. But overall, and I think it's really important to stress this, and I, I think most people um, across the country would recognise this, the vaccination programme is going incredibly well. We have, I think, 34 per cent, uh, or just over 34 per cent now, uh, I think that's on yesterday's figures, uh, of the over 12 population who are vaccinated with booster uh, JAGs. Uh, that compares, I think, the next uh, country is Wales with 31 uh, and a half percent or England with 31. So we are significantly ahead. Does that mean everybody's having a, a flawless experience? No, of course it doesn't. And we will address that um, as often and as far uh, and as quickly as we can. But those working on this programme are literally saving lives every single day right now. And they are doing it at pace uh, and they're doing it with utmost determination. And all of us really do owe them the most immense debt of gratitude. Emma Harper to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Given the public health advice to redouble efforts in terms of face covering, space and infection control measures, can the First Minister advise whether the Scottish Government intends to update guidance on the type of face covering the public should use to ensure it is FFP2 mask or equivalent and ensuring that it is worn over the nose and the mouth and disposed of or laundered properly? First Minister. Well, we have published guidance on face coverings and uh, it's certainly kept under regular review. Uh, but a face covering can be a covering of any type except a face shield, uh, which doesn't fall within the definition that covers both the nose and the mouth. Uh, due to 
equality and accessibility considerations. We don't mandate certain specifications, but we do recommend that face coverings are made of cloth or other textiles and should be two or preferably three layers thick and fit uh, securely around the mouth, nose and chin, while allowing, obviously, somebody to breathe easily. And our guidance is in line with the WHO recommendations. Dean Lockhart to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Emerging variants of COVID-19, such as Omicron, may over time require the development of updated vaccines. What discussions is the Scottish Government having with the UK Government and the JCVI on the potential need to develop updated vaccines? First Minister. That wouldn't really be the role of the uh, JCVI uh, to do that, although obviously it has, is integrally uh, involved in advising governments about who to vaccinate. But I know uh, there are discussions of this nature ongoing all of the time, but I know and uh, members will have heard uh, many of them talking in the media in recent days that the vaccine uh, companies are already thinking about how they may need, and it is May at the moment because we don't yet know the impact, but may need to uh, change or adapt vaccines to deal with this new variant. Some of them have given indications. I heard Pfizer do that publicly uh, the other day of how long they thought that would take. Um, and so this work is already underway. And given you know, how quickly, relatively, uh, the vaccines were developed from a standing start, I think we can have confidence uh, that the scientific community and the vaccine uh, developers and manufacturers uh, are well placed to do anything that is required. Uh, but we don't yet know uh, that the vaccines are less effective. So uh, let's not assume that at this stage. And even if it is the case, vaccines are still, the current vaccines are still going to be hugely important. And John Mason. Hey, thank you very much. I mean, now that we gather that the booster jag is to be given three months after uh, the second one instead of uh, six, uh, does that mean that immunity is waning faster than we had expected? And does it mean that we have to get a booster every three months? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I don't think it necessarily means uh, either of these things. It is not uh, necessarily the case that we suddenly think uh, immunity is waning faster, but we have a new variant that some think uh, may uh, manage to evade the immunity of the vaccines or natural immunity from past infection. So the importance of getting as many uh, to be sort of uh, non-clinical in how I'll express this, as many antibodies into people as possible becomes all the more important. So that's the rationale uh, for reducing the gap uh, at this stage. And we don't yet know uh, what the frequency of this vaccination programme will be in years ahead. My working assumption is that this will be a like flu, this will be a regular uh, vaccination programme. We should certainly be planning for that. It may be, uh, and we don't yet know, it may be a regular three-dose vaccination programme, or there may be developments in the vaccines that uh, enable it to be a single dose. There's so much we don't know yet. We need to get on with doing what we do know, which is getting boosters to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's statement. COVID-19 update. Point of order, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, I wonder if you could help me. Um, on a number of occasions, the First Minister and Cabinet Secretary say, if you write to me with a request, we will look into it. Uh, uh, Officer, I've had a number of constituents I've written to uh, different Cabinet Secretaries on, and it's taken over 20 days to get a reply, often with urgent inquiries from constituents. Can you help me? How do I get a quicker response so I can help my constituents? Um, and is there any way that you can intervene to make sure that we get the appropriate response at the appropriate time? Thank you, Mr Balfour. Um, Mr Balfour may be aware that that is not a matter um, normally for the Chair, but that his comments are now on the record. Thank you.